So we're excited to have you all with us for this presentation on Rethinking Audubon with Krista Elric, Greg Nobles, and Judy Pollock, uh, moderated by Danny Aboud. My name is Catherine Game, and I'm Executive Director of Brushwood Center at Ryerson Woods. Um, we're really excited for this conversation. We know there's so much interest in this topic. Uh, when we planned this exhibition, we didn't know how, what wonderful timing this would be as well. Um, in addition to migratory bird season, this just being a really poignant topic um, kind of across the environmental field right now as we look at our history and re-examine and relearn. Um, so we're excited that you could be with us um, and be with Brushwood Center for this conversation. Brushwood Center's vision is to support resilient and connected communities, both human and ecological, where all lead healthy and thriving lives. And our mission really centers on improving health equity and access to nature through partnerships, through community action, and the arts. Our programs serve youth, families, veterans, and active duty service members, and those facing racial and economic injustices through partnerships with more than 80 organizations and 350 artists across our communities. And we see some of you in the audience today, so thanks for joining us. Um, we're excited that you're here. Uh, Brushwood Center honors this land on which we work as the traditional home of Algonquian-speaking peoples. We celebrate their traditions and culture, and their immemorial ties to this land. Uh, and so today, you know, we invite you to join us in rethinking this relationship that we have with the environment and the histories of all peoples as we challenge the legacies of settler colonialism in our society and relearn and re-understand together. So at this point, I'd like to welcome Julia Kemmer, who is our Director of Arts and Administration to share more about this exhibition, um, which inspired today's talk. Julia. Thank you, Catherine. Hello, everyone. Um, now through the end of April, we have the honor of hosting artist, activist, and writer Krista Elric's exhibition, Where Are the Birds Retracing Audubon? This exhibition is the culmination of a decade-long project where Krista traveled to and photographed the locations of Audubon's original Birds of America artworks to see if anything remained of Audubon's landscapes today. But the project doesn't just stop there. She meticulously researched these locations and the cultures and peoples of these lands to explore the history. And if you've read anything about Audubon recently, you know it is a history like that of several other prominent figures of the American environmental movement that is fraught with controversy and unpleasant truths. Beyond the artistic and environmental merits of this work, which are significant, it is this opportunity to examine and discuss a tarnished hero that we are excited about because it gives us a chance to talk about the dilemma of what to do with problematic historical figures once the full story comes to light. We invite you to visit Brushwood and see the exhibition. If you cannot come to Brushwood, there will be a 360 tour available on our website within the next few days. Now to contribute, to, excuse me, now to continue this important discussion, I will turn things over to our very own Danny Aboud. Thanks, Julia. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Danny Aboud. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the Director of Community Programs and Partnerships at Brushwood Center. And I'm very excited to moderate this uh, panel discussion we've organized today. Um, if you've heard me talk at all at any presentations or honestly just in conversation in the last few months, you've probably heard me say the phrase that the environmental field is at a crucial turning point. Um, but it's true. <laughs> We're grappling with the difficult reality of transitioning to new systems that are rooted in equity, inclusion, and environmental justice for all. And while there are incredible strides and programs and achievements coming from the grassroots portions and the folks on the ground in our sector, we're still seeing a lot of major organizations and leaders struggle to maintain and match this energy and, and this moment of change. And I think a lot of this comes from the difficulty of having to reckon with that complicated and dark history of our field that Julia spoke to. It's one that's rooted in white supremacy, in the expulsion of indigenous peoples and enslavements of people from Africa. But today we hope to unpack some of this history in the form of 
unpacking the history of John James Audubon and his legacy on this movement, what it means for us today, as well as shedding light on what modern day birders and naturalists in our region are doing to pave the way forward. And we will be saving some time at the end for Q&A as well. So please, as the conversation goes on, hold your questions, hold your thoughts, feel free to drop stuff in the chat that you want us to revisit later. Um, we'll be opening up some time for discussion. But to begin, uh, I want to ground us our conversation with some community agreements and group norms just to maintain um, a brave space for this conversation. As we said, it's kind of it's it's not an easy one to have, but there's a few things we can do to make it easier. The first being that we are here to listen to understand, not to respond. So really taking in what people are saying and taking the time to process it before immediately launching into your your next point or a counterpoint. Um, acknowledge that each of us comes to this conversation with unique perspectives and experience. Any hurtful comments will absolutely not be tolerated. Um, you'll be, sorry, kicked out of, not sorry, kicked out of the Zoom call <laughs> for violating these rules. Um, we also ask that you share the mic. Our time together is limited. There's a lot to be said on this topic and we won't be able to cover absolutely everything. So we ask that you be conscious and share this discussion time with others. Something I like to think of when in these conversations where it can be exciting and you have lots of the things you want to talk about is, is this comment necessary or crucial, or am I just really excited and I want people to know that I agree with them, <laughs> which we get it, but you can always just pop in the chat and uh, shout out and highlight the things that you that you enjoy others saying. Uh, and finally, we ask that you hold grace for those around you. This is a really complicated topic. There's a lot of history that we are constantly learning and unlearning, and none of us are born perfectly socially conscious. We've all said and done things that harm other people, but we also have the potential to hold ourselves accountable and do better. So if you say something that you don't love, pause and offer something new in its place. And as always, if needed, please feel free to apologize. Uh, we can move forward together. Uh, to start, uh, now that we've kind of had these community agreements in place, I want to uh, begin with, are we doing an introduction first? I'm so sorry, Catherine, of each panelist, or are we going as we speak? As, as you speak, yeah, thank you. Okay, perfect. Then I want to begin with Krista. Uh, Krista, as Julia said, your exhibition, Where Are the Birds, revisits the history, sites, and species of Audubon's work and documenting and responding to the changes since his original visit. So I would love to give you the floor to speak a bit about this work and the role that art and culture can play in unpacking this narrative. Thank you so much. I seem to be having some technical problems. Can you see me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can. Um, I can't seem to see the meeting or the video and I'm sure it is on my end and I'm not sure. Hmm. We can see and hear you well. You can? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Well, I, I first wanted to give a big shout out to the entire staff at Brushwood, especially in the preparation for hanging my exhibition and for the planning of this amazing layer of events that are being offered while my show is on display. I am deeply honored to have been invited to contribute to this very important conversation. I also wanna thank the Brushwood uh, Center at Ryerson Woods for your confident approach to uh, building authentic long-term relationships with community-based organizations. I noticed it on your website under your um, mission statement. And, and that is why I'm here. I'm so excited to be a part of this at this time in um, the Chicago region. Before we get started, I wanted to, uh, in what is gonna be a very lively conversation, I wanted to acknowledge a few of my relatives and friends from near and far who have long supported my work. Um, they know who they are and they've been uh, with me uh, with their love and determination. I, I would not be here with you this afternoon. I want to give a very special thanks uh, to Dave Warren and uh, Ed Ranny. If you're watching right now, I I'm sending you grateful hugs for your patience and your persistence with me. Why don't we go ahead and get the video started? Is, is that on? It started, Krista. <laughs> it started. I, oh boy, this is where I can't see it. So um, for me, the best way to really understand the world was through the lens of my cameras. And um, I'm 
also a student of history, and this is what how I make sense of the world around me. I, I began photographing uh, birds as metaphor about 20 years ago and received a public art commission with Jack Leffler in Seattle. Uh, we were making a film about cancer and how it affects patients and their families. It was Jack's idea to initially uh, use birds as a metaphor. I was opposed to it because I didn't know how to photograph birds. But after some initial attempts, uh, I liked what I was making and uh, the desire to make more became an obsession for me. It was about 2010 that I uh, was introduced to Audubon's journals. And, um, and that's when he really got under my skin because I wanted to find out where the birds were. And um, in his lifetime, um, from 1785 to 1851, is a period that's right before the Industrial Revolution. And that's when the rivers uh, ran wild and the old growth forests were managed by indigenous peoples throughout the Americas. And, and the uh, natural world was abundant with uh, native plants and, and animals. And this is what really interested me because I, I wanted to see that myself. Uh, my exhibition mirrors uh, the book and um, I, I, it, field work was really about following uh, his uh, biography very uh, closely. Uh, in my book, um, his words lead the story and I respond with my photographs and impressions of a place. Uh, the book is in seven chapters or episodes where Audubon leads me and us uh, into seven different adventures that he takes. Um, my work is silver gelatin. I use film um, in my cameras and they are intentionally uh, in pieces because I was very frustrated not being able to find the birds that he had written and painted about. And so I intentionally um, made images that are in fragments. They are not perfect and uh, they kind of, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to piece together what was images of an already la altered landscape. Um, the original maps that, uh, and banknotes uh, from Audubon's time uh, helped uh, me understand the human dynamics and the growing economies that destroyed the habitat for birds. And, and all of this was before 1862 and the Civil War, which of course the Civil War contributed to the environmental and human desecration um, of the landscape. And so trees became my subject matter, the oldest trees possible. And that's how I could uh, really begin to understand the place and the habitat. Um, um, finding the exact locations to these uh, places where Audubon wrote about was actually pretty easy, much easier than I had imagined. Uh, most of these places are now county preserves their state or national parks, uh, their private ranches and, and parking lots and commercial buildings. Um, many of these places are named after Audubon, even though he may have only visited for a few days or a few weeks. Um, these places seem to identify themselves through Audubon in, in all their written materials. Um, Many people who I visited in places that I went would name their homes or their rooms, their bedrooms in honor of, of Audubon's visit. And his name is spread throughout the United States um, in this kind of fashion, even though he may not have even visited um, these areas. He attracted attention wherever he went and he was controversial in his lifetime. Yeah, and he remains so even today. I'm ending my slideshow um, with a few photographs from his gravesite, um, which is in Trinity Church Cemetery and Mausoleum, which is located in New York City in the present day Washington Heights area, which is now called the Audubon Parks District. Um, and I thought I would um, uh, help stimulate the conversation with the other panelists by ending with uh, the image of Audubon's tombstone, which oddly is a Celtic cross that was is decorated by sculptured trees. Um, it was erected in 1893, long after Audubon's death in 1851. 
And like many monuments built at this time, which was after the reconstruction area of 1865 to 1877, we're still grappling with um, the impact of these monuments uh, in our public spaces. And, and I, I thought that it would be a good way um, to uh, bring up a, a yet another set of uh, confusing issues about his life, just with um, the tombstone itself, because we're all grappling with this history. And, and that's why this conversation will help our society heal and recover for all life, including birds. And I'm so excited to talk about how that recovery can happen, uh, even in the face of climate change. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with you and, and uh, hearing what the other panelists have to say. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Krista. Fantastic. Um, really, really stunning images. Also, everyone, I really hope you can make it out to the Brushwood or check out the uh, 360 tour, as Julia mentioned. Uh, Chris's work is really stunning. Um, I want to jump over to Greg. Uh, Greg, in your 2020 piece for Audubon Magazine, The Myth of John James Audubon, you said something that I think is really, really important in framing this conversation. You discuss how some people try and dismiss Audubon's role as an enslaver as just a product of his time. Um, despite, as you point out, the reality that many, many men and women uh, in the antebellum era took a very strong stance, uh, an outspoken stance for abolition of slavery. Um, so I would love just to have that kind of context as you speak a bit more about the reality of John James Audubon as a man and the relevance that his, this figure plays in the context of our modern day movement. So Greg, I turn, it, I turn it to you, our resident historian. Thank, thank you very much, Danny. And I too would like to join Krista in expressing my thanks to people at the Brushwood Center for making this exhibit possible and frankly, for making this afternoon possible. I also have to say thanks to uh, Krista herself. I'm a big fan of her. I'm a big fan of the book. Um, I call Krista the best friend I've never really met. Uh, we've been on Zoom <laughs> meetings any number of times, but uh, never actually have been in the same physical space. So someday, someday, maybe at Brushwood, who knows? But um, yes, Danny, to answer your question, I think Audubon is one of those uh, very interesting but also very uh, frustrating figures in, in history. And when I talk about Audubon, I like to give him his due uh, as an artist and as an ornithologist. Um, you can see the image of this uh, the snowy egret that I hope is on your screen. Um, and one thing Audubon did was very important as an artist, he depicted all the birds, as he put it, size of life. Uh, that is exactly the size they are in, in reality in the field. And by doing that, he allows us to see the birds, every feather, every detail, uh, in a way that you probably couldn't see it in the field. That bird is frozen there, and you can study it for hours if you like. And that's true of all the 435 plates that he did. Uh, and so I think that, and again, the ambition of Audubon, uh, the ornithological ambition to get every bird in America, every bird in the United States, he was claiming them as a national project, but also as an ornithologist, he was quite good. Uh, his book, Ornithological Biography, five volumes, 3000 pages, it goes along with the birds of America, has these very, very detailed descriptions of birds, sometimes down to the measurements, you know, the size of their uh, claws, the size of their feet, uh, their, their, their throats. Uh, and it's a very useful book still, I think. And so in terms of Audubon as an artist, as an ornithologist, I have to do what I think everybody would and say, yes, he's quite good. But, and there's always the but, there's a very troublesome side to Audubon too. In fact, there are troublesome sides, plural, I would say. Uh, a number of people are always unhappy with Audubon, uh, first of all, because he shot so many birds, sometimes dozens, even hundreds at a time. Uh, people, I think, especially today, look back at that and say, well, that's just cruel. Um, but, you know, that was the way science worked. That was the way Audubon and other um, gentlemen of science worked. He's also been accused of uh, some measure of scientific fraud, uh, certainly mis misidentification of different birds, uh, probably most famous is the bird of Washington, uh, an eagle that he named for George Washington, trying to curry political favor. Uh, and it's probably an immature bald eagle, 
but uh, he's been accused fairly recently, frankly, in a British uh, uh, biological journal of engaging in a very conscious scientific fraud. Uh, I might say he simply made a mistake. I'll cut him a little bit of slack on that. But there are other errors, too. Uh, Audubon depicts a bird called a carbonated warbler. Uh, I've never seen one. You've never seen one. Nobody ever has, except apparently for Audubon. Was it a fake? Or just uh, he got lucky with one bird that then became extinct? I don't know. There are other examples. Um, but I think that whatever one might say about Audubon's uh, errors or perhaps misrepresentations in terms of his artistic and scientific work, there's one issue that simply cannot be dismissed, cannot be argued away, and that is Audubon's attitudes on race, his practices uh, about different people. Uh, Audubon engaged in uh, skull collecting, uh, first picking up the skulls of Mexicans uh, after the Battle of San Jacinto in Texas. Uh, he later uh, desecrated uh, at least one, if not more, indigenous graves uh, to collect skulls. And this was, again, part of 19th century science, craniology, the notion that you could study uh, people, different kinds of people, and make racial distinctions uh, based upon their skulls, the measure of their skulls. And of course, those racial distinctions were not just neutral. There is a question of, of racial superiority inherent in that. But the critical issue that can't be set aside is Audubon's engagement with the institution of slavery. He was a slaveholder. He bought and sold other human beings. He was dismissive of abolition. He thought the British certainly had gone too far, but he was aware of abolition. And he was on the other side, what I would call, frankly, uh, the wrong side of that uh, on the abolitionist debate at the time. And yeah, people are inclined, I think, sometimes to talk about Audubon as a, a quote unquote man of his time, as if somehow that time was different from this and therefore we can't judge him by 21st century standards. I understand that. I get that. But I think there were other men and women of his time who did have a different position who did have what we would call a more enlightened position on the question of slavery. And so I can't really set that aside. I, I can't just say Audubon lives somehow in the past and we're in the present and the never the two will really connect. And I think that's what's really striking about uh, Krista's book in this regard. Uh, you know, we look at the images, the various sorts of images in that book, and we can see them for what they look like. We can see them for what they do. Uh, but I think we also see them for the ways in which they uh, connect the past and the present, the environmental past and present to be sure, but I think also uh, the social past and present and uh, the political. And I think Krista's book is certainly an object of, of beauty and wonder, uh, but I think it also causes us to wonder about what might be behind the beauty. And that, I think, is how we get into looking at Audubon, not just as an artist, not just an ornithologist, but uh, a figure in history, not simply a man of his time, but a man whose time needs to be investigated. Beautifully put, Craig. I really love that. Um, and I'm grateful to you for investigating it and for calling it out and calling it forward in your work. It's really wonderful. Um, we'll be sure to follow up if people didn't check out ahead of time. I think we had shared on our website and in the autoresponder to the registration, a link to some of uh, Gregory's writing. Definitely check him out if you haven't already. I'm sure many of you already have. Um, but I'm gonna switch now finally to you, Judy. Uh, as we were prepping for this conversation last week, you said something that I really loved, which was that Audubon offers us a chance to interrogate our history as Americans, which I think is such a beautiful transition from what Greg just said. Um, so I'd love to hear from you about what this interrogation looks like from your position and how uh, Chicago Audubon Society is responding. Uh, thank you so much, Danny. And uh, yeah, I also just really wanna add my thanks for the invitation to join this panel. It's, uh, it's just really so interesting and I'm so grateful to be here. Um, yeah, so, so I'm not, you know, an artist or a historian. I'm basically a person with a big mouth, president of uh, Chicago Audubon Society. And we wrote a letter um, saying that we, uh, we encouraged National Audubon to change their name uh, away from the Audubon name and 
and also um, that we were going to change our name regardless of what they did. So National Audubon is on a kind of a, um, a, a schedule, a loose schedule, and they have a committee, um, which interestingly, uh, Greg is on, um, and that, that committee is examining whether or not they want to change the Audubon name. And, you know, there's a lot to it, I will say. We, we get people, we just get giant texts in the mail from people we don't even know just because our name is Audubon, more than one, you know, uh, that's a sort of a regular thing. And it's kind of hard to give up, you know. So I think um, we hope that Audubon comes up with a name that's, uh, that equally stands for bird conservation because, you know, the Audubon name is a really, um, you know, they have a really great reputation for doing important bird conservation work and a lot of great work has been done um, in that name. Also, you know, just in terms of thinking about all the Audubon centers around the country and the, the um, amount of changes that would have to happen, you know, they've got sculptures, they've got big uh, signs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like not a small uh, undertaking, but uh, I think uh, we really feel that, that uh, it was time, that it's time. And I was very surprised, you know, to take a poll of our board. Board was very, very, very supportive of this. and. Um, since we've uh, released the letter, which you know you can you can see it on our website in the news section, it's at uh, chicagoaudubon.org if you'd like to read all of our um, our thoughts about it. But um, since we put the letter out, you know we've gotten some press, and really the responses have been very very positive. Uh, you know on our social media, super positive, and you know the comments under the various news uh, articles. You know few people saying that we're woke, but but really a tremendously positive response. So uh, I was I was surprised, I was sort of bracing myself for something different, but really, really excited um, to see that response and to see that there are just, you know, so many people uh, who agree that it's a, it's a name that's time uh, has sort of come and gone. Um, so I, uh, I bought a copy of Chris's book. I've been working my way through it. And I also went to see the exhibit. And, uh, you know, the topic, I mean, as you saw, it, it's a little bit of a tough one, right? Going back to the places that Audubon went to, um, you know, and finding some of them to be very, very transformed uh, and not for the better. Um, you know, just a, a lot of, um, a lot of, the imprint of human activity uh, on on those places, what used to be these wild rivers and uh, you know diverse forests, and I found I found yesterday that I that that was really weighing on me heavily. Uh, you know, just just the idea of the changes that we've made on the landscape. Um, you know, it, it it was it was really tough. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm usually a pretty optimistic person, you know, I get out there and do what I can do. Um, you know, I've had, you know, certain successes, et cetera. But um, yeah, you know, yesterday I wasn't feeling that optimism, I will say. And this morning I woke up early and I was just laying in bed and there was a cardinal singing. And, uh, you know, birds sing in the same sort of register that humans speak. You know, they've, they've kind of, they have a... Um, yeah, their register is just geared to our ears. Um, and uh, I was listening to that Cardinal and I was thinking, and I, I was thinking a lot about denial, you know, because there are so many people that walk around uh, this planet and they do not hear the birds, which is astonishing to me because every single bird is talking directly to me, even whether I'm talking to a person or not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing those birds. And to me, like the amount of, psychic energy that has to go into denying hearing bird songs is is just huge and uh you know i think it goes along with the denial that we have about all of the depredations that our human society um has created right um so um that was where I was this morning, you know, just, just thinking about denial and, and thinking a lot about, about our human history uh, on this landscape and um, 
you know, and uh, Danny's question about how 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 do we how do we move forward? Because we are in a moment where I think we are, um, you know, some of us are recognizing, some of us have known for a long time that, that uh, you know, we need to do things a little differently, or we're we're not going to have a future here on this planet. Um, so um, I just have some notes here. Yeah. So, um, you know, thinking a lot about this time that Audubon was active, you know, that's a time when we had this euphemism of, you know, settling the West or westward expansion as if, as if there was no one there uh, that was calling the land home. Um, you know, so we had this incredible um, process of kicking people off of their land going on. And then we had these naturalists that were going around and acting as if they were discovering species that, you know, the inhabitants of the land knew full well and had names for, you know, they were giving new names for things. I just think about that incredible erasure that was going on at that time. And, you know, the denial that we still have today about the impacts of that on our, on our history. Um, and, you know, the result that we're dealing with today uh, of this kind of exploitive economic system, which exploits resources, exploits people, and exploits wildlife. Um, you know, and to me, that's a lot of what Krista is um, is, is expressing uh, in her artwork in, in various different ways. You know, there are a lot of ways into that, um, to, to those thoughts, and just to think about the exploitation that we've created in, in such a very, very short time. Um, so yeah, so you know what? Why why did we want to have a new name? I think I think a lot of reasons. You know the reasons that Greg has spoken of the ties to slavery, uh, the ties to uh, phrenology. You know which basically the collecting of these skulls to prove that the white race was superior, um, but also just not to be looking back to that time in history and not to have not to have people from that time on a pedestal, you know, we, we feel like if we're gonna be welcoming and forward looking, we need a name that reflects that, you know, we don't, we don't need a name that really leaves out so many people in our society. Like it leaves out me as a female, right? I, I read those biographies of those old naturalists and I just think, man, these guys would just, run around out in the woods and then bring a whole troop home and expect uh, their wives to serve lunch to them, you know, <laughs> it's like, really that, yeah, uh, so, you know, it kind of, they, they kind of leave me out and, uh, you know, I think they also certainly leave out people, you know, descended from slaves and um, indigenous people and, you know, just, uh, it's, it's not, it's not an identity that, that really welcomes people. So is, there's a lot of costs to changing the name, but I think that um, I think that there's just a tremendous benefit. And and you know, I'm I'm hoping. So we now there are um, five different Audubon chapters that have come out and said that they're going to change their name. After we we just came out last month and said it, and even after we did. Uh, two others came out, and then there were two that had before. So, you know, it's it's starting to be a there's starting to be a significant signal from the field, and they're they're on both coasts and the Midwest. So, uh, you know, we we're hoping we're hoping that Audubon will come up with a name so that we don't all, you know, have to go through this uh, process of choosing our own names. Um, yeah, so. You know, just thinking about um, moving forward in conservation, um, I, I kind of feel that we should be um, examining a lot of things about our communications. You know, we're we're very big in conservation on tone policing. Um, you know, we don't ever act angry. We've learned not to do that, uh, even though there's plenty to be angry about. Um, and you know, we we're sort of always grateful for the crumbs that we get. I mean, I think we have to think about our relationship to power. You know, we are we're big on influence hoarding. You know, we 
we'll get a contact and we will hope that no one else talks to them so that we can, uh, you know, continue to, to influence uh, them. And, uh, you know, honestly, philanthropy is another thing to look at, even though I feel like we're sort of in the living room of uh, very wise and generous uh, philanthropists, but, you know, just the bigger issue, um, you know, is um, should uh, the rich have, have so much power in a democracy to, to um, be setting our agenda, uh, you know, especially our conservation agenda, which is, which is very much in the realm of uh, philanthropy, you know, and I mean, aren't these important conservation questions, things that should be sub subjected to the democratic process and that uh, our government should be responsible for. So you know, I feel like there's, there's just a lot to think about as we're going forward. And, and I do, I very much appreciated um, Danny's comments uh, uh, about this new generation of conservationists who I think is really bringing wonderful questions with them and is, I think, going to, um, you know, kind of force us to change, I would say, uh, which is something that I, I really welcome. So I think, you know, having more voices at the table is just a really, really critical uh, for conservation going forward. So, um, you know, just, just thinking about where we are in conservation, um, you know, where we are in this country. I mean, this Audubon brings up a lot, but but I do want to say when I was listening to that cardinal um, this morning, you know, I, I thought about I thought about why Audubon has so much appeal, right? You know, he's a guy that's tromping around on the landscape and he's finding these birds. You know, he's he's not in any kind of a state of denial. He he's taking in all everything about nature. You know, he's appreciating birds and um, you know, I can really understand why the people who did take his name with the Audubon Society, and you know, by the way, that came, I don't know, is it 50 years after his death or something? He was, he, um, the Audubon Society was formed around 1900 um, and he had long been dead then, but I, I can understand why they wanted to name it after him uh, because it is a kind of, um, you know, a kind of breaking through of that denial that we do have about the natural world and, and our impact on it. You know, uh, he was a person that, um, that, you know, really represented just getting out there in nature and just paying attention. And that's what we, we still need to do that today. So, uh, you know, every, every figure has its sort of pros and cons. And um, I, I think Audubon does too. So I, you know, I think we, we sort of, in a, in a certain way, reluctantly uh, leave that behind and um, hope that we can, you know, go into a future maintaining that, that same spirit of, um, uh, you know, of just listening, uh, listening to what nature has to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and again, I just thank you. Thank you, Judy. That brought up so many wonderful, you brought up so many wonderful points. Um, I think I just really love to this. It is important, I think, to highlight like why it's so tempting to romanticize this figure. And I think a lot of it ties back to what you spoke of, of that deep separation and what Krista's work explores, right? That separation from humans in the natural world that came with this white settler colonial approach to wilderness, right? The John Muir idea of the mountains being out there somewhere else and there's nobody living there. So it's perfect and we can preserve it just as it is. And we'll pretend that we're not pushing hundreds and thousands of people off of the land that they've been occupying for millennia, right? So it's it's this very romantic idea that's rooted in this idea of wilderness that's just so disconnected and wrong. And it keeps us in this place where it's hard for us to think about conservation holistically because it says something that's out there that's so distant and separate from people. And then the reality is people are always going to be part of our landscapes and we can't just treat conservation and human society and human issues as separate and opposing things, right? We have to think about it as these integrated systems and we have to think about ourselves as part of that picture of nature. Um, and making sure that our definition of nature includes everybody, unlike mm -hmm. unlike uh, Audubon and his contemporaries. But I just want to thank all three of you for your wonderful remarks and your work. Um, this is really incredible, and it's it's a small part of a much bigger struggle, as I said, that we're facing right now in this movement. But I'm really grateful to you for your for your work on this.
in this field. Um, we do have time for questions. I'd also love to offer a moment as people throw questions in the chat. Um, if the three of you have any responses to each other's comments or any thoughts you'd like to share with one another. Um, I personally always love when panelists actually get to talk to each other a little bit. I feel like that rarely ever happens because there's always so much expertise and so much to say. Um, well, if I could say a word of reassurance to Judy, uh, I think about that other uh, woman in Audubon's generation, Emily Dickinson, that hope is the thing with feathers. Uh, and perhaps that might be the hope that you found uh, in listening to the Cardinal this morning. Beautifully put. That's nice. I also um, wanted to just say some words of um, hope that I have, uh, especially because um, I live in New Mexico in, in, and um, I live in a state where the, the tribes and the Pueblos that uh, have inhabited this place through a millennium have a, a good deal of power within our uh, legislature and in the state and, and in our daily lives. And I mean, my goodness, they're my next, my neighbor, I, and I, 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 I eat dinner with them and I, uh, go to dances on a regular basis. It's really part of our lives. And, and um, we know that um, there are some really big changes that are happening thanks to the help of Deb Holland and, and the Interior Department. And, and so we know that um, supporting sovereignty uh, uh, and, and the tribes um, desire and authority to do such is, is a way that uh, we can all learn more and, and uh, become um, uh, more aware of, of how life was before um, European settlement. And that knowledge is still so deep and vast and active. And, and so that's where I find the hope is when we see uh, tribal involvement, tribal sovereignty being um, uh, really respected. And, and that is where we can start to see bigger changes happening uh, in, in <clears throat> land use throughout the country because all of this is Indian land. And, and so that's where I start getting pretty excited and see um, ways to uh, build partnerships in areas of co-management and in the land back movement. Absolutely. Beautifully put, Tissa. Um, I love to see it too. There's a lot of exciting things happening in terms of uh, rematriation of land to Indigenous sovereignty and stewardship, and there's a lot of cool models to follow and to try. Um, we do have a few questions coming into the chat. The first I will uh, pose to Judy. I don't know if, or, uh, if you're able to answer this question, uh, but another Judy asks, uh, what are some possibility, possibilities for the new name for Chicago Audubon's chapter? If you have any to share, but if you can't, we understand. Oh, I can't wait to answer that question. I love it. Okay. It has to be Chicago, all the birds, right? No. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I support you know, it. Like the bears, the birds, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you know, I, I don't know. The, the one that has changed its name so far was this uh, Audubon Naturalist Society, which is not associated with National Audubon, but it's a society that did have Audubon in their name. And they changed their name to Nature Forward. Um, so that's the only, you know, data point that we have so far. I'm sure that, um, I'm sure that once National makes its decision, you know, either we'll take that name or we'll get together with the, you know, the six other chapters. But, uh, I, you know, if you got ideas, put them in the chat. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it'll it'll be a long process of coming up with a name because, you know, I, Audubon is a name that really resonates, you know, and has a has a legacy and it stands for something. So. Totally. Uh, excited to see what comes forward. Um, Greg, uh, somebody asked, uh, what happened to all the bird specimens that Audubon collected and have they been a valuable contribution to science? Well, um, a lot of the specimens he collected, uh, frankly, after he painted them, they <clears throat> were just discarded, they decomposed. Uh, now there are uh, a lot of bird specimens to be had. If you go to the Field Museum in Chicago, as I did some years ago, 
uh, they have tray after tray of bird specimens that are remarkable to hold. And so a lot of 19th century and even early 20th century uh, naturalists did collect specimens, but you know the vast majority that Audubon shot uh, were simply uh, discarded afterwards. So in, a, in terms of scientific research, no, most of those did not uh, become part of the, uh, uh, the available set of specimens. Uh, but Audubon did save some, other naturalists sent him some, and some of those specimens did wind up in uh, uh, collections. So there's, uh, there's that. Awesome. Um, Krista, question for you. Uh, Carlos asks if you could talk briefly about your evolving awareness of Audubon as this controversial figure and how it affected how you photographed um, your work and the work that you made. Well, like I said, uh, I, I really kind of admired him when I first began. And, and again, primarily because his words were so descriptive about this place that uh, I, I really wanted to get to know. And um, I just got so excited uh, reading about him and the earlier biographies, not, not yours, uh, Gregory, were kind of uh, showing how, uh, what a cool guy he was and just uh, really had the world at his hands and, and just kind of move through space in a, in a way that uh, was well, without consequence. And um, uh, then um, more specifically, uh, it's chapter two or episode two in my book. It's um, the, um, the Swan of December 25th. And, and that's when uh, in 1810, uh, Audubon and his partner, Ferdinand Roger, go down the Ohio River and it's in, in yeah. December, and they're trying to find a new place to open up a, a mercantile uh, store. And they get caught at the confluence uh, of the Mississippi and the Ohio River. And uh, they start camping out and get, um, it's a, which is, that, and that area is a major um, hunting area for native indigenous people. It's a huge flyway. It, an internationally important flyway right now for birds. And, and, and so Audubon along with, uh, he brought whiskey to get him around and, and, and seek favor. And he meets up with what he calls some Shawnee Indians and uh, they go on a hunt. And they end up uh, killing uh, about 50 trumpeter swan um, right there and it, and it was on December 25th. And um, he's very gleeful about the whole experience and, um, and the feathers would be used uh, for the European uh, fashion industry. And all that information just is not what I learned in college uh, history classes or in high school. And it was just very stunning and very uh, difficult for me to absorb. And, and so that's um, when I really uh, started to break up my images even more and, and really uh, make them both um, try to make them beautiful, but uncomfortable and irritating. And um, so that it would show the viewer that things were not normal. They were not uh, to be seen as um, um, absolute beauty in the landscape were all as well. And um, so it was a, 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 it was a process and, and he, I really needed to better understand why it happened so early in, in US history. And, and it really were the banknotes and the maps that helped me understand that at the American Antiquarian Society. I wanna give them a huge shout out. They offer fantastic fellowships and in, uh, in creative uh, study and allow you to get into those archives. And um, uh, so that really was the turning point for me to really start to collage and, and mix up uh, materials and media to show how much change had happened and um, how difficult it is to kind of look at it and but hopefully to find some way to recover and respect uh, what was and and bring back you know a more diverse ecosystem so that you know quite frankly we can all live a healthier life and not just with humans but every living being. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I want to uplift a comment I'm seeing in the chat from Rika, who's calling out um, uh, the decision currently being debated in Alaska on the Phillips Billow project, which will impact the uh, area, an area that's the headwaters of a lot of flyaway destinations. Um, they state capitalistic exploitation is still very powerful. Indigenous voices are still being suppressed over corporate interests, and native corporations are speaking over the individuals themselves. Um, so I just wanted to thank you, Rika, for sharing that. And it's a great reminder that, you know, as we've said, this kind of past and present aren't separate, right? There's this continue, continuity we see between this, the attitudes of Audubon's time and the way that we treat conservation now. Um, this exploitation of indigenous people and the removal of people and separation from their lands is still something that happens in the modern day. It's not just history. Um, and it's maintained and continued in modern day policies. So definitely please pay attention to the local battles happening in your region, to the environmental fights, uh, environmental justice fights happening across our country. And we definitely need to be uplifting indigenous voices and leadership and activists and all of these, all of these battles and all these fronts. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question for Greg as well, uh, from ask, asking if Audubon expressed his views of race in his journals, which I know he did very explicitly, but I'd love to give you the chance, Greg, if you want to speak to that at all. Well, he did, yes. He, he expressed a lot in his private correspondence. Um, and then, yes, in his journals. And there's a, a remarkable story uh, in ornithological biography called The Runaway, in oh. which he claims to have encountered a, a, a fugitive slave and his family. Uh, I can't go into the details of it here. I, I ask, invite people to read it. It's called The Runaway. It's in, I think, volume one or volume two of Ornithological Biography. But it's this fascinating, but also kind of compli complicated fantasy that Audubon has about trying to, in his mind, uh, uh, to help uh, a fugitive slave. And his solution is to return him to slavery. Uh, it, it, it's, I think we read it and think uh, it seems nuts, frankly. But I think Audubon was trying to uh, have it both ways, to look like somebody who could, uh, you know, point to the worst aspects of, of enslavement, and that is having families broken up by sale, but not come out against the institution itself. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people would look at Audubon and uh, a lot of his, in fact, some of his biographers said, well, he just wasn't really against slavery and let it go at that. Uh, and I think that, you know, reading Audubon in the journals, uh, in certainly in ornithological biography, and yes, yeah, sometimes in his private uh, communications correspondence, you get a pretty good sense of uh, where this man stood on the most critical issue of his era, which was slavery. Thank you, Greg. Absolutely. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. If there's any last minute questions, feel free to, uh, to continue to contribute those in the chat. But again, we'll be following up with uh, the resources we shared at the um, beginning and throughout this presentation for folks who are interested in learning more. Um, we cannot recommend enough that you follow these three people and read their writings, follow their work. Um, Keep an eye on the Chicago Audubon Society and see what happens with that name change as well as the national, the national trip. And please join us at Brushwood Center. Um, we would love to have you at our uh, exhibition of Chris's work. It'll be on display. Um, we're open Mondays and Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. as well as Sundays from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, and it'll be on display through April 30th. So come out and see us. And if you can't make it, there's a 360 tour uh, of the exhibition available on our website. It'll be coming up in the coming days. And Catherine just dropped a link in the chat to where you can find that. Um, but I just want to say again, I'm so grateful to the three of you for joining us for this conversation. Krista, for sharing your work. Um, Judy, for everything you're doing on the ground, trying to push forward this movement as an enthusiast and as a passionate member of the Audubon Society. Greg, for your work as, your, as a historian and a writer. Um, I just am super excited to be part of this field and to be part of these kinds of conversations and grateful to be at an organization that hosts them. So uh, with that, I think we can say thank you all for joining us and keep an eye out for, for more from us in the future. <laughs>